Welcome back. Small and medium-sized businesses and family businesses are significant contributors to GDP and also account for the majority of private sector employment. One way SMEs can raise capital in order to expand and grow is through crowdfunding. Is this concept the new way forward for SMEs and startups? And will this concept ultimately help create the much needed jobs in our region? We continue our conversation with Dr. Nasser Saidi. Tell us about the concept of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is a, is a, is a major innovation in my view. Um, what it does is it allows investors to invest directly into companies without going through a financial intermediary. So if you're a young company, you're a startup or an existing SME, and you're looking for capital to expand, to grow your company, you come to a platform, to what we call a crowdfunding platform, you explain what your business plan is, you say what you are about, uh, why this would be interesting for investors, what sort of return they can expect, um, and what you're going to be doing with the money. If you make a good pitch and you manage to convince the investors, they can come and invest directly in your company. And they can invest amounts of, say, nearly $100 or 1000 or 500 which means that um, I call it democratic capitalism. It, it's, it's, it's available for the, the public, for the crowd. Um, so the SME or the, or the startup now has access to capital. They, they can grow. Um, you can have a large number of investors coming in, maybe 100, 200 if you're lucky. Um, depends on, on how good your pitch is. And it means that um, you have a community out there that is supporting you not some anonymous investor who's bought shares in, in an exchange or part of a fund who doesn't really care about the company. So I think we're back to grassroots and this is why I think crowdfunding and crowd investing in particular is so interesting. Now it is these principles that Eureka is based on which you are the vice chairman of. Tell us how Eureka started and how it works. It started with some young people um, developing a platform. Um, I had started work as, as well on it. I found them. Uh, so we joined forces. Um, we launched Eureka earlier this year in, in, in May. Um, it's meant to be a platform to cover the whole region, the, the whole world, um, the, the, the whole Arab region around us. Um, it, it is a platform. Uh, it allows any company from across our region to come and make a pitch. Um, as I said, you need to prepare your, your business plan. You, you need to come with a convincing pitch. Um, it's open to any company from any sector, so we don't, we don't have restrictions. What I would say, however, is that you have to be internet savvy. You have to be open to social media, uh, to have followers uh, through Facebook, through Twitter, through other social media. That's important because um, you're not advertising in newspapers, you're not going through the banking and financial system, um, you're not looking to a small set of investors, you're looking to what we call the crowd. Um, and as a result, your message needs to be well understood uh, using, using social media, uh, using um, the internet, television, etc. So for example, you have, a, you have an important role to play in, in promoting uh, companies that want to use that want to use crowd investing. So how does Eureka evaluate and select those businesses that are looking for potential investors? Our role um, is, not, is not to do an economic or financial assessment. That's not our role. We're not, we not investment bankers and we're not financial advisors. So we have to be very careful. What we do is we are a marketplace, a platform that allows investors to get in touch with companies and potentially invest in them. But what we do do is we undertake due diligence to make sure that you are truly what you say you are, that you are established legally, that uh, you're not involved in money laundering, that you don't have a background of bankruptcy or criminal activity or other undesirable activities. And we aim to do that on both sides, that is both of the companies as well as of the investors. Um, beyond that, we need to make sure, of course, that you have an idea that, that flies. In, in many cases, people wake up in the morning, they, they've got a brilliant idea. 
that does not necessarily mean you have a brilliant business. So translating a, a, a brilliant idea or a concept into a business is a different category. So we assess, if you wish, does your business plan hold water? We don't go into the economics of it. We don't look at, at whether truly you're, you're going to achieve it. So we're not telling you, yes, okay, this is, this is great. But you can immediately see whether you are prepared to have investors uh, alongside you. But that means that you would have to be willing to be 100% transparent. I think that's what's great because um, once you're, you're out there on the platform, you have to disclose, um, you have to be transparent. And on top of that, uh, you have to answer any questions that a potential investor might ask you. And you do that online. And therefore, your answer is available to anybody who would want to invest. And therefore, disclosure uh, is not some obscure information memorandum that you might get from, from a, a, an investment bank. It is out there for everyone to see. And therefore, um, you are open to um, anybody asking you a question. And therefore, um, it teaches you a couple of lessons about how to address the public, how to convince investors. Um, it teaches you uh, that you need to grow up, that previously you were just talking to friends and family. Friends and family, of course, are, are an easy target. But once you get out to the crowd, it's a totally different pitch. Um, so it's a way, really, of, for startups and SMEs to grow up. And once they've successfully achieved that, um, it means they can potentially go on to the next stage. Um, if they've grown, um, they have revenue, they're successful, they can potentially then go to the stock exchange, they go, go to the stock market. And what has the feedback been from investors so far? It's still early days. Um, investors have been very interested um, because this is something completely new. And they're just finding out about how to invest through, through platforms. And here, I think you need to distinguish between what's called crowdfunding and crowd investing. Crowdfunding means you typically make a donation. So, for example, in the United States, Kickstarter uh, is well known. Uh, that's a platform that allows you to make a donation. So, if somebody wants to um, make a film about climbing Kilimanjaro, they'll say, Look, I, I need $50,000 to finance the trip. Uh, at the end of it, I'll give you uh, the video of my climbing Kilimanjaro. If you find that exciting, then you might contribute $100 or $1,000. That's um, crowdfunding. Crowd investing is a different category where you're actually taking equity. You become a partner in, in, in the company. Um, so for investors, this is something that, that's, that's very new. And for young people, I think they love it because uh, the, the idea of investing was something that mommy and daddy did, right? It's something that you, you go to, to the markets for and you talk to your bankers too and, and all the rest. But when they see their friends and colleagues sort of starting off a company, uh, establishing one, and then saying, hey, why don't you join me? Um, they, they, they love that. So what we're seeing is that um, mm -hmm. it crosses across different categories, but you're getting more and more younger investors. And I, and I think that's great. And finally, with SMEs and FOEs constituting the majority of businesses within the region, you have proposed the development of a capital market dedicated to these types of businesses to be called Nextband. In your opinion, how necessary is this? Yes, because our existing exchanges across the Arab world, um, I would say, discriminate against smaller companies. It's too expensive for them to list. The compliance requirements are too high. Um, the capital requirements uh, are, again, are again too high. For a typical company, if they want to go and negotiate with a regulator to get listed, it might cost them easily two to three million dollars. <laughs> For a company that's only worth five or ten, uh, you, you're, you're, that's an enormous barrier. So you need to do things differently. Uh, what Nextband does is it lowers those requirements, um, it makes it accessible to, to small companies, and it makes a big change on the regulatory side. Instead of a small company having to deal with the regulator directly themselves, with the Capital Market Authority, you go through what we call a nominated advisor, a nomad. 
the nominated advisor's role is to help you to list. And so they help, help you with the documentation, help you with the, your business plan, all the legal and regulatory requirements. And subsequently, once you're listed, they will continue interacting with the Capital Market Authority. So you remove a big burden of compliance of the small company, letting them focus on their business rather than focusing on legal and regulatory issues, uh, which can really uh, kill them and divert their attention. Um, I'm talking to six countries at the moment to, to launch it across them. It's one single technology platform, um, but what it would do is it would allow um, Nextpan, say Casablanca, to be part of the Casablanca exchange, but a second tier window within the Casablanca exchange. Uh, Tunisia, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, UAE, Oman, and open to other countries as well. Um, I'm hoping that the governments will be open to the idea. Uh, we need it. If you go back to our discussion, um, if you're going to be creating jobs, you need to create them in the family-owned businesses and the small and medium enterprises. And if the small and medium enterprises are to grow, they need the financing, they need the capital. Uh, equity capital through stock exchanges gives them the capital to grow, um, means they have access to uh, investors. Uh, there's trading, so there's exit for investors, which is what the investors always want. They want to be able to get in, but also to, to, to get out. So I'm hoping that um, governments hear the message on the street that uh, we want jobs and that they'll understand that those jobs need to be created in the SME sector. And this is giving them a solution of how to help the SME sector. Dr. Nasser Saidi, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. And we look forward to see further developments unfold for both Eureka and Nextband. Now, the spotlight's on fashion in the UAE this month, not because of the latest designer boutique launch or a celebrity-endorsed clothing line, but an art exhibition. The Law of Beauty, running until the end of November at Sharjah Art Museum, showcases drawings and photographs charting 100 years in the world of fashion and promises to illuminate more than just changing styles, as Lucy Taylor finds out. The UAE is undergoing something of a fashion revolution. Style has come to the forefront of society in the past couple of decades, with a flurry of big-name brands and haute couture boutiques flooding the malls and drawing the crowds. But it seems that public interest now runs a little deeper than the superficial. The younger generation are increasingly appreciating fashion as an art form and even a career path, and want to learn more about its age-old allure. This is what makes the new exhibition at Sharjah Art Museum, The Lure of Beauty, such an appealing prospect for a whole range of UAE residents. The idea of fashion amongst the youth, not just today, I mean, always it was quite popular, but obviously now with, the, with, the, with all the access you have, whether it's online or to the media, I mean, it's a lot more recently, but the concept and the evolution of fashion was always here. If you walk through any shopping mall or any public place, you would notice even with the local dresses. So for the youth, yes, fashion is, is a very big, uh, big thing here. Uh, the exhibition consists of around 450 works uh, of different mediums. You have photographs, sketches, uh, illustrations, in addition to magazine covers and negatives. And then at the same time, it was not just uh, randomly displaying artworks. We had to like put it in a, in, in a proper context to tell a story through these works. So it was done in a chronological way and it tells you the whole history and the whole evolution of fashion in the European world. One man who believes wholeheartedly in the power of fashion to educate is Martin Fevers, the collector responsible for this vivacious and varied catalogue of sketches, prints, paintings and photos. The collection can teach people about the history of art. We have 100 years of, of art, can teach about 100 years of fashion can teach about traditions of these periods, um, the, the idea of women uh, we, which are seen on the pictures. So we have photography, we have different kinds of, of illustrations, we have so many periods. That's what I think they can learn. It reflects maybe the movement that is, is already happening here, the changes in fashion. There is a fashion development uh, in, in, in the Middle East of the way women wear their abaya. And there's a local flavour to the exhibition as well. 
it's so wonderful to have an Arab uh, fashion designer and uh, not, of course, an, anyone. This is uh, Sheikh Khalid al Qasimi's uh, design. So, of course, it, it was uh, no question then in the end to, to include it in, 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 in the show because the works are so great. And it seems that their faith in this exhibition is well placed. Ever since the launch on September 24th, crowds have been flocking to admire and even learn a little something from these images spanning more than a century. Yesterday I noticed, I mean, apart from the, uh, the regular loyal visitors we usually get, I mean, I noticed quite a lot of new faces and, and new people even. I was really quite pleased about that and very happy because uh, we've been working on this since the last two years, this whole exhibition, over two years. And now to actually see it up on display for the people, for the public to come and, and actually have a look at and see all the hard work we've done, it, it was a very, very rewarding experience. Whilst the UAE has fast become the style capital of the Middle East thanks to malls full of couture clothing, it looks like the market is maturing as people realise that the field of fashion can teach us more than simply how to dress. This is Lucy Taylor for UAE Weekly. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can contact us at uaeweekly at city7tv.com or by calling us on 04-367-2230. But from myself and the entire team, have a great week ahead.